All right. Let us. Hey, Hank, how you doing tonight? Present and well. All right. Let us go to our Father and pray. God, you are who you say you are. You can do what you say you can do. I am who you say I am. I can do all things through Christ. Your word is alive and active in me. I am that I am, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the creator of the heavens and the earth and the fullness thereof, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, all there is, all there was, all there will be, the Almighty. Abba, 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 shine your face upon us that we may be saved. All have sinned and fallen short of your will and your glory. Your name is worthy to be praised. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your grace, mercy, and love, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Peace, joy, and purity. Strength, courage, and healing. Awareness, abundance, and expansion. Most of all, Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus, who went to the cross on Calvary shed his blood for remission of our sin and the salvation of our soul. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that abides with us each and every day. Now, Father, we ask you to bless each and every member of the St. Frederick's family, Father. Touch their hearts, souls, and minds. Keep each and every one of them safe, safe from hate, safe from hurt, harm, and danger. Father, we ask you to bless this lesson tonight. Let your word go forth and penetrate our hearts, souls, and our minds. Speak to me, speak through me. Father, let your energy flow tonight that we may be edified in your presence. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Good evening. All right. So, what we know as Christians, you can put on the pen, the head of a pen, and have room left over. What we think we know, or what we know, I don't think we really begin to scratch the surface. Or the things we say we know, and we say we think we know, I don't know. Which is the answer, I don't know. Anyway, let's talk about um, what we know as Christians, and look at what the author has to say has to say tonight. Almost immediately after his well-known conversion experience at Elder Street, John Wesley struggled for a few months over his uncertainty, uncertainty of his own salvation. Receiving little help from his friends or church, his thoughts began to turn inward. Focusing on his sinful failures, he, began, he became increasingly despondent and dejected. He sought relief by opening passages within the Bible at random. But when that also proved unfruitful, he continued his downward spiral. Finally, he sank to such depths of despair that he made the following shock, shocking notation in his journal. My friends affirm that I'm mad because I said I was not a Christian a year ago. I affirm I'm not a Christian now. Downward spiral into despair, feeling dejected, questioning his own salvation. So our group discussion, we look at exactly that. How well can you relate to John Wesley's experience? How can you relate to John Wesley's experience? Has anyone ever felt that no matter what we've done, that it just didn't seem like we were doing enough. It just didn't seem like we were right with the Most High. And it was just, we were just spinning our wheels. Ever get that feeling? Or how often do you get that feeling?
there's been times that I've wondered recently as I was growing and becoming more filled and getting more understanding of the Word of God, I began to question what I was taught made me wonder where have I been and what have I been doing all this time? Made me wonder, have I lost my mind? You know, like John Wesley, if you've experienced major change in your life, you're going to question, am I crazy? At one point or another, that's going to be a question you ask yourself. Have I lost my mind? Folks around you, not going to understand you. They're going to tell you, you lost your mind. But now you know you're in good company. Those who seek to save their own life will lose it. But those who lose their life for his sake shall find it. So what John Wesley went through was a losing process to be found in Christ. What we go through is a losing process in order to be found in Christ. As long as we think we know, as long as we act like we know everything and we got everything in order, we can't receive. It's too much in the container. Something has to come out for something to go in. My spiritual rebirth was such a powerful, undeniable experience that I walk with conviction. When I feel distant from the Father, I know it's my fault and need to reevaluate my priorities. Amen. Not long ago, but I felt that way. All right. Not in a long time. I'm sorry. Not in a long time, but I felt that way. Okay. Yeah. It's, uh, I think it's a natural thing. It's a natural thing. And we already talked about when. When were these times that you least assure us in your salvation? When you think you're losing your mind. Amen. <laughs> so, we're going to pick from Dr. Tony Evans tonight again. How important is the assurance of salvation? Well, the way John writes, let's read the scripture before we go into that. I have written you these, we reading from my, I'm reading from the complete Hebrew Bible, the complete Jewish Bible, uh, 1 John 5, 13 through 21. Starting at verse 13. I have written you these things that you may know, that you may know that you have eternal life. You who keep trusting in the person and the power of the Son of God. This is the comfort, this is the confidence we have in his presence. If we ask anything that accords with his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, then we know that we have what we have asked him for. If anyone sees a brother committing a sin that does not lead to death, he will ask. And God will give him life for those whose sinning does not lead to death. There is sin that does not lead to death. I am not saying that he should not pray about that. All, all wrongdoing is sin. But there is sin that does not lead to death. We know that everyone has God as, as his father does not go on sinning. On the contrary. The son born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. And we know that if we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the son of God has come and has given us discernment. So that we may know who is genuine. Moreover, we are, we are united with the one. Who is genuine? 
united with his son, Yeshua, the Messiah. He is the genuine God and eternal life. Children, guide yourself against false gods. Guide yourself against false gods. So, how important is assurance? John wants everybody to know that if you trusted in the Son of God for your salvation from sin, that you have an eternal life. John has been driving that point on Every chapter, every verse that we've read, John has been driving that point. You believe in Jesus, you got salvation. You accept Jesus, you got salvation. If you abide in the Spirit and the Spirit abides in you, you got salvation. He has made a point of reassuring us every, every lesson that as long as we're doing what we're supposed to do, staying tuned in in alignment with God, we've got our salvation. You have to know in your heart, soul, and head. I don't know what happened, but I felt the change. <laughs> All right. All right. Assurance is part of the essence of saving faith. There's nothing like knowing that you have a reservation that has been taken care of. That's assured. You know when you leave here, and you're going on a trip, you've got a space that's been set aside because you made a reservation. Assurance is a reservation, for lack of a better word, that we have eternal life. Jesus paid that price when he went on the cross. If eternal life, if, if eternal life could be lost, then guess what? It ain't eternal. If eternal life could be lost, then it ain't eternal. And, and, and the good thing is, it ain't based on us, our faith. Because today we believe, tomorrow we doubt, the next day we on top of the mountain, the following day we down in the valley. That's just how, that's just how we go, up, down, and sometimes in circles. But it's based on the object of our faith. And what's the object of our faith? It should be Jesus Christ. And if that's based on the object of our faith, that's a rock. And that rock is steady. Eternal life doesn't just mean time. No, we, we're talking about more than time. When something is eternal, we're talking about quality. When we talk, you go to Sears, you buy something, you say, it lasts forever. That's something that you pay for, something that's good. If something is good, it lasts longer than we live. That's our eternity. So we're talking about a quality of life that is beyond what we can imagine. John wants you to do more than live, for, live forever. In this letter he's writing, John wants you to have an intimate relationship, and there's that word again, an intimate relationship. We've been talking about this whole section, having an intimate relationship with God. When we have an intimate relationship, we can have that eternal relationship because it's a lasting relationship. If you ever had a friend, if you ever had a, 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 a significant other where you didn't have an intimate relationship, how long did that last? When intimacy is gone, what is the relationship based on then? And we talked about that earlier. We go back to the legalistic aspects of the relationship. That means because we are believers, we still have a seat in the kingdom just because we believe. Now, where are you going to sit when you get in the kingdom just because you believe? Well, it's just like being married to somebody you don't have a intimate relationship. you in the same location, but you're not on the same wavelength. He wants us to lead a meaningful life in Christ and through Christ. That's why he has constantly gone over the same things again and again. The deeper the intimacy in our relationship with the Most High, the more confidence 
you can have when you pray. In other words, when you know that you know that you are on the same wavelength with the Father because you're believing in the Son and the Holy Spirit is dwelling with you, when you get on your knees to pray, whenever you pray, you can go to your Father boldly. You can boldly approach the throne of grace and ask for what you want. Ask for what you need. He already knows. He already knows what we want. He already knows what we need. But now, how are we going to ask? Uh, Daddy? Can, uh, maybe? Guess what your answer is? Come back when you know. Approach the throne of grace boldly. But you cannot approach the throne of grace boldly if you don't have an intimate relationship. Okay? So, how do you know when you're in tune with God and praying according to his will? We're talking about being intimate. How do you know? Well, we begin with his word. Pray the Bible and all the promises and his commands. In other words, we use the words God gave us to talk to him. He wants us to use the words that he spoke so he'll understand, well, he understands what we're saying, so that he know that we understand what he's saying. He wants his word and his will to be done in your life, in my life, and when we pray for others. He wants his word to be done. He wants his will to be done. In 16 to 17, John gives an example of a confident prayer that is according to God's will. Now, we can ask God for anything. But when we look at the model prayer, it says, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If it is not, your, if it's not God's will for you to run the Boston Marathon, meaning you're not in shape to run the Boston Marathon, you ever done anything to be prepared to run the Boston Marathon, don't ask God to go to the Boston Marathon unless you're just going to watch. Psalm 1. Blessed are those who reject the advice of the wicked and don't stand in the way of sinners or sit where the scarf or sit where the scoffers sit. Amen. Their delight is in the analyzed Torah, and the Torah they meditate day and night. Amen. That's developing. When you meditate on that word day and night. Analyzed Torah means God's Old Testament. The first five books of the, uh, the Pentateuch. The first five books of the uh, Old Testament, all right? So, John gives us an example of that, and it will involve horizontal expression of love. And when we talk about horizontal expression of love, again, we're talking about loving one another, those that's without, within our reach side to side. When we love God, we love him vertically. When we love one another, we love him horizontally. If we see a believer that's committing a sin, he needs a believer who is intimate with God to intercede, excuse me, to intercede for him. Mm -hmm. All right? Moses used his intimacy to intercede for Israel. Exodus 37, 7 through 14. All right? The four men carrying the paraplegia they took to see Jesus to be forgiven, when he saw their faith, they're interceding on behalf of that man carrying him. He was healed. Reaching out to help a brother or sister. Reaching out. When we reach out to help a brother or sister, we open the door for God to allow piggybacking on our faith to receive deliverance. In other words, when I pray for you, you pray for me. We pray for one another. We are accepting we are interceding. We are speaking in your behalf. In other words, I'm giving myself 
in your place. All right? Now, when somebody wreaks, heart, wreaks havoc on God's family, there may be consequences. John reminds us that he's not saying that we should pray for that, but he doesn't say that we shouldn't pray for it in such cases that we cannot answer to what that prayer is doing, that kind of prayer. Again, we go back to when we intercede for that person, we're taking. We're taking and we're helping with that responsibility. Now, if that prayer, if that person is committing a sin that's leading to death, we don't need any part of that. Not all sins lead to death. But if it's a sin of hatred deep in the heart, we don't need to be a part of that. They have to carry that on their own. All right? 18 and 19. Your walk in the Spirit determines your victory over sin. Your walk in the Spirit determines your victory over sin. In other words, if you are not spiritually aligned, if you are a Sunday morning signal catcher, which obviously y'all are not because you're here tonight, you're not just Sunday morning tune-ins, that's, um, what do we call it back in the first uh, chapter? Satellite Christians? Y'all not satellite Christians. Y'all tuned in. You have a, a constant signal coming back and forth. There's a signal going up and a signal coming down. So that's your walk in the spirit. That determines your victory over sin. I had a preacher cousin who used to say, little prayer, little power, much prayer, much power. That's like um, me going to the Boston Marathon today. I may walk. Uh, I, I give you two miles. And after two miles, I'm done. And I'm walking. Because I have not trained for that. I'm not ready for that. And some time back we talked about how God prepares us. We have going into a crisis, in a crisis, and coming out of a crisis. And we talked about the training, your training, you got your preseason, your midseason, and your postseason workouts. When you're in the middle of a season, you shouldn't be trying to do no preseason workout because it ain't going to help. And if you're in the middle of the season doing postseason workouts, it ain't going to help you. You need to get prepared. You need to be prepared before you get to that battle. This is where your spiritual walk in. in. If you have not prepared for that spiritual walk, I don't care how much power, positive thinking you got, how many New Year's resolutions, New Year's resolutions you have made, you, 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 you just made some resolutions and thinking positive. But when you walk, your spiritual walk is right, and you're right with God. Satan cannot touch you. Even though, the scripture says, even though the whole world is under the sway of the evil one. Yeah. He can't touch you. Because your walk or you tuned in the way you're supposed to be, you're on the same wavelength within the Father. And we we're on the same wavelength with the Father. We cannot sin because he's in us. He will not dwell where there is sin. Light and dark cannot op operate in the same space. It's either going to be light or it's going to be dark. And if he's in there, there is no darkness. The darkness has to come out. All right. 20 and 21. Jesus Christ is the Son of God who came in the flesh. Jesus is the Son of God who came in the flesh. You can't have spiritual, you cannot have a spiritual life or intimacy with anybody else. Well, you can try. But your spiritual life won't add up. You won't get what you need to get in order to get spiritual growth. You can try to have uh, intimacy with, um, I don't know, your car. Make that your idol. Um, 
a hundred dollar bill, make that your idol, or whatever. You can you can try to have a, a spiritual intimacy with those false gods, knockoffs. Um, they 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 just not gonna be able to give you the same result. Okay. John is urging us to accept the truth that Jesus Christ is the, is the true God and eternal life. So we need to guard ourselves from idols. All right? Guard ourselves from idols. And an idol, an idol God is whatever you choose it to be. Whatever you choose it to be. Verse 13 summarizes pretty much what we've been studying. So what are some of those things that we know that we have for assurance? I've mentioned a few of them. What are some of those things? What has John written? What has John been talking about all this time? Good to see you, Quint. Anybody? With some of the assurances that we have. Intimacy? And this one of them we talked about, abiding, hanging out with, him being within us. The fact that Jesus was born, died, and rose again. Just to name a couple. So, knowing those, knowing that, I'm back. All right. Knowing those things, how have those things referred to in verse 13 help you gain greater assurance of your own salvation? Nobody? Intimacy? Being on the same wavelength? When you're on the same wavelength, when you ask God for something, He does it? That should build your confidence that He's answering your prayers, that He, heal you, that he hears you, but you have to be more than a satellite believer. You have to be on the same wavelength. You have to be in tune. So how can you be assured that your prayers would be answered? Look at verse 14 and 15. This is the confidence we have in his presence. If we ask anything that accords with his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, 
whatever we ask, then we know that we have what we have asked him for. Let me read that one again. That one got kind of good to me. <laughs> In the spirit. In the spirit, all right. This is the confidence we have in his presence. If we ask anything that accords with his will, he hears us. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. What does God will for us? Those things that are in our highest and best interest. We are the children of the king. Now, how many king's children do you know run around looking like anything? I bite you. Looking like they don't belong to somebody. Not one is in tune with his father. Now, if you got a radical prince or princess that's the king's kid doing what they want to do, not doing and following the royal order, you might have a problem. Prayers, amen. You might have a problem. And surprise me, nobody is wrote that we have talked about many times our father answering prayers, but he answered our needs. We, when we pray, and he will answer our needs and not our want. Did that, that ring a bell with anybody? Yep. All right. Now, verse 16 and 17 provide one illustration of the kind of prayer that can be made in confidence. Who should we be praying for and why? If anyone sees his brother committing a sin that does not lead to death, he will ask. And God will give him life for those whose sinning does not lead to death. If there is sin that leads to death, I'm not saying he should not pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. Who should we be praying for?
you should pray for everyone, but you should be careful who you allow to pray for you. Okay? That's true. Everybody, you should not let everybody lay hands on you. But we talked about something a little bit earlier in that verse that um, about intercessory, intercessory prayer, interceding for somebody else. You know, everybody's heart and mind is not in the right place. But we're talking about who you should pray for. Go back and look at that verse again. Look at verse 16 and 17 again, carefully. If anyone sees his brother commit a sin that does not lead to death, he will ask and God will give him life for those whose sinning does not lead to death. There is sin that does not lead to death. I'm not saying he should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. So who should you be praying for? Oh, okay, yes, sir. All right, but who should you be praying for? I like the fact that you took a, took a good shot at it. Amen. Don't quit. Don't quit. Fellow, who, fellow believers who we can intercede for when their sin is not going to cause us harm in our prayer, okay? If it does not lead to death, that's what the book says. All right. In light of the whole context of this epistle, epistle what might be the distinction between a sin that does not lead to death and one that does. We talked in the earlier chapters about sins that lead, to, that cause death. Hatred in the heart, hating your brother, being one of the main ones we talked about. So if you look at the Ten Commandments, and you think about the Ten Commandments, which sin will not lead to death. But we know we have another God before God that, that that's death. For our brother and sister who are believers, but all focus. Amen. All right. And what type of sins are we talking about? What separates us from the love of God? What separates us from the love of God?
Okay, what do we do to move away from God? How about that? A sin that doesn't necessarily lead to death would be not being in fellowship with one another. That's not going to lead to death unless there's hatred involved in that. Okay? But if there's hatred in that, that's a sin that leads to death. You become a murderer. That's what we talked about in the previous lessons. So why would John encourage a person involved why would John not encourage prayer for the person involved in the sin that leads to death? We talked about that. Why would John not encourage, not encourage prayer? There should be a not in there. For a person involved in the sin that leads to death. back. John gives us an example of a confident prayer that is according to God's will. And that involves horizontal expression of love. If we see a follower, a fellow believer committing sin, he needs a believer who has an intimate relationship to God, with God to intercede for him. Moses used his intimacy with God to intercede for Israel. The four men carrying the paralegic took him to Jesus to be forgave and was healed when, they, when he saw their faith. Reaching out to a brother or a sister, we open the door. We open the door for God to intercede, to let them piggyback on our faith to receive deliverance. They're piggybacking. We're co-signing for that person. We're co-signing for that person. So we don't necessarily want to be a co-signer in somebody's death sentence. Well, we don't want to intervene. We don't want to intervene when somebody's in a sin that's going to lead to death. Because then we're, we open the door and we're allowing, we're, we're asking God to come in. And we're putting that person on our back. They're piggybacking off our faith. And you don't need to put any extra burdens on your faith. With a person that's committing, committing sin that's going to lead to death, when you take on that burden, now your work, your work just got a whole lot harder. And you may not necessarily be equipped to take on that extra burden. And you, as the pastor just said, you're inviting someone in. In other words, you're opening a spiritual door for an evil spirit to come in that you may not be ready to handle. Okay?
Look at verses 18 and 19, please. We know that everyone who has God as his father does not go on sinning. On the contrary, the son born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Another New Testament author writes, Your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And you'll find that in 1 Peter 5 and 8. In light of that danger, how are you encouraged by what I just read in verses 18 and 19? What does verses 18 and 19 tell us we need to worry about? Well, it was clear. We are protected by God, and the evil one cannot touch us. We are protected by God. We are protected by God. So how do you know you and God's family and not the world's family? We know that we are from God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. You got to go back to the beginning. How's your connection? How's your intimacy? Do you believe that Christ is your Lord and Savior? Just that much legally gets you in the kingdom. You're going to have a rusty halo, skinny cloud, and a woolly robe, but you're in the kingdom. How, did you, how do you know that you are from God? Who hangs out with you? Well, actually, who do you hang out with? How do you know? What does verse 19 tell us? It goes back to that intimacy. That intimacy. That abiding. Him being in us. And when the light is on and he's in us, we cannot sin. So the reflection of your daily living will let you know if you are his family or not. I mean, if you can, if you can sin um, relentlessly, constantly, with no problem, you know who your father is. <laughs> so how does, coming, how does the coming of God's son enable us to know the true God in contrast to the false conceptions of a God that continues to surround us. What did he give us? 
In verses 20 and 21, what did he give us? And we know the Son of God is coming, has given us by the Spirit, faith, by Spirit, faith, and our relationship with the Lord. Okay? And through that, we get discernment. Discernment. So that we may know who is genuine, and moreover, we are united with the one who is genuine. United with his son, Yeshua the Messiah. He is the genuine God and eternal life. Children, guide yourselves against false gods. All right? What certainties in this passage are most encouraging to you? I can't answer this for y'all. Y'all have to answer this one for yourself. certainty is wrong. But the one I like the most is when we go back and talk about praying his will when we praying in his will and his will be his will shall be done he can hear you because you're praying for what he wants you to pray for you're doing what he wants you to do That rings out for me. Because if I'm praying and asking God to do what God wants me to do, that means I'm in alignment with him. I am hearing him speak to me so that I know what to ask for. And then the Holy Spirit, when it makes his groanings, it groans back to God to tell God, yeah, this is what he needs. But we truly, really and truly don't know what to ask for. We'll be asking for something off the wall that makes no sense. Anybody else? Because he teaches us to alert, to be alert to wolves in sheep clothing. Yes. That's knowing who you are, and that's discernment. Being able to see. Being able to see. Anyone else? Pastor, you ready? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. yes, sir. My prayer, when we look at this, what we know as Christians, as Christians, we should know that we are a child of God. I'm Think about your parents. How many times have your kid got in trouble and you was not there? You always came to your child's aid every time it was possible. You were always there. Our father is always with us um, and I, I, I like uh, uh, Quincy's uh, 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 answer and I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna turn it around and, and just call it a question when he says not everyone uh, can pray for me realizing that we don't have that control. We don't know who is praying for us and when. Um, none of us can even actually say that somebody somewhere ain't even calling your name out and have a voodoo doll or something going on. We don't know, but what we do know is that we are a child of God. 
and he would not let anything touch us. So when I thought about that and realized that we are worry wards. We worry about every little thing. But scripture here tells us I, I'm staying within our lesson tonight at uh, verse 18. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one touches him not. I don't care how many voodoo curses that people throw your way. I don't care how many prayers that wasn't righteous that somebody has said in your name. They will not touch you if you believe and accept Jesus Christ as your own. We have talked about before and, and, and even as parents when your child asks for something crazy ridiculous we look at them and we move on but understand prayer prayer the Holy Spirit first hears that prayer and if it's off the wall, crazy, it's not going no further. It's going to the trash. But we got the Holy Spirit. We got Jesus himself sitting in a session for us. You remember the man that spilt his blood, that curtain of blood that's protecting you from the Father. Neither one of them is going to let anything crazy get to our Father's ear. So nothing wicked. Pray it over you. No voodoo dolls will affect you as long as you are a true believer in Christ. Staying prayed up. I always tell people, read the word for yourself. Get a complete understanding. Realize that nothing wicked is going to be able to touch you as long as you have Christ. He's got that hedge of protection around you. Now, if you open the door, then, as mama say, you deserve that whipping. <laughs> but if you keep that door closed, we know our father's knock. We know our father's voice. We know if it ain't the right voice, don't open Many of us that heard mama, daddy, say something, give that little grunt or whatever, and no matter where we at, we know that Pacific sound. We know our father's voice. Answer when he come and knock, and we will always be safe. Continue to pray, continue to stay in his word. And Satan has no hold on you. Realizing that we're walking right now among wickedness, this barren land. That's why he tells us it's going to be passed away because there's so much evil right here among us that us believers are 
the ones who needs to do his will, change someone's mind, if possible. Sometimes we can't. We shake the dust from our feet and we move on. But continue to pray. Continue to lift your brothers and sisters up. Give them a encouraging word. And just keep God first. God bless you. Amen. All right. Wednesday, we come back, same time. And we'll be looking at Lesson 11, Truth and Love, coming from 2 John. Truth and Love coming from 2 John. Also, tomorrow we got uh, mission, outreach, mission Outreach going on. So if you are not extremely busy and you got some time to come in and help serve some meals and clean up or whatever, it will be appreciated. Or if you hungry, there's no reason for anybody to be hungry. Make sure between the hours 11 and oh, 1245 to be safe. When you get here, you can be of service or you can be served. All hearts and mind clear. Let us thank our Father for tonight. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the evening. We thank you for opening our hearts, our minds, and our souls. Father, thank you for speaking to me and through me, awakening my own mind and my own heart to see what you've been telling me all along, Father. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus. I ask you to continue to bless and keep each and every one of us tonight. In your holy name, the name of Yeshua HaMasiah, Shah Salom. Amen, amen, and amen. Amen. Good night, all.